The main purpose of any machine protection system is to ensure a safe operation and to protect humans, people, environment and the machine from any dangerous situation. Today we have Oliver again here in the studio. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Joost. Um, he will explain us the purpose and the main parameters of functional safe systems. So what will be the key takeaways for our viewers? Yeah, key takeaways of today's sessions will be how you can, as an operator, assess the SIL requirements, the PFD requirements, the key parameters, as you said, and then also how you can influence those requirements and the achieved SILs, and then also how to avoid common pitfalls, mistakes you can have in selecting and operating such safety instrumented systems. You just mentioned PFDs. What does PFD stand for? PFD stands for probability of a failure on demand. I will do a little bit of a deep dive later, <laughs> but thank you for the question. <laughs> okay, anyway, so now you're just uh, on your way to start. Okay, thank you and welcome again. So when we're talking about functional safety and SIL safety integrity level requirements, this is applicable to any operator of critical processes. So in the center, in the core of this whole consideration is a process. So when we're looking at any given process, the inherent risks of any process may be such as you handling some toxic, you may be handling process with really high pressures, temperatures, radiation or you have high mechanical energy, all these are potential risks to human safety environment and this is shown in a so-called risk graph. So we have the process risk here um, with increasing of these critical factors you have an increase of process risks and the goal is to reduce the remaining process risk to a tolerable level. You will never make it to a zero risk as soon as you operate any process, there is a risk. So, but you have to obtain a goal to bring your current process operation to a tolerable risk. And you do this by implementing certain layers of protection. And as such, every process has a BP basic process control system. This controls flows, pressures, temperature to stay within the boundary conditions as per design limits so you wouldn't burst the vessel. You run the machines in the design limits. This, this is the basic process control system. Next level would be work orders in place, mitigation uh, measures such as physically building a wall around the process, having mitigation measures such as nobody can enter the production hall when the machine is running. That is the second layer of protection in this risk graph. A third level is a safety instrumented system, what we'll be discussing today. And a last response, if you will, is an emergency response method if the whole process gets out of control, all the other measures have failed to control the process to the tolerable risk, there is something in place for say a unit evacuation or on a larger perspective a, a village or community evacuation depending on the nature of your risk and process you're running. In order to control this there are the different layers and today we'll be focusing on the typical applications of a safety instrumented system, an SIS. In essence, every safety instrumented system consists of those three components shown here in the simplification. There is a sensor feeding a signal into a logic, logic solver and there is a final element, a final actor. This could be your motor breaker, for example, on a rotating piece of equipment, final element. Um, and this, in essence, builds the core of a safety instrumented system. There are two relevant standards for this context, and these are the IEC 61508. This is relevant for the vendors and those producing those systems. And there is the IEC 61511, which is relevant for the operator of such systems, of such processes at the end. And in the context of the IEC standards here, the 
probability of any failure within the system, whether it's a sensor, it's the logic solver, it's the final element, any possible failure of such component needs to be evaluated and to come up with a total risk, a total probability of failure on demand of that SIS system. One question from my side. What are the failure modes in this SIS system with regards to the functional safety? Are there any typical failures that occur? Yeah, uh, obviously depending on the nature of the system there are different failure modes. So the sensor, the logic solver and the final element may each fail in one way or the other and in that evaluation a distinct um, there has been a distinguishment between failures that could lead to a dangerous consequence and those that are non-dangerous. For example, a non-dangerous failure on the SIS system would be if the logic solver, if a rack-based system has a failed LED that has no safety relevance. That is non-dangerous, may or may not be detected by the system but has no safety relevance. Something of more drastic nature is if you lose core sensors that protect the asset, you lose the sensor is broken. This is a dangerous event if that is a critical safety sensor and this may be detected by the logic solver so then it is called a dangerous detected failure mode. This will not be taken into consideration for the PFD for the probability of failure on demand calculation, but there is another problem and that is a dangerous and undetected failure mode and those are the ones that are really going to bite you as an operator if these uh, dangerous events remain undetected and there is a factor is the lambda DD and the lambda DU and of all of these the lambda DU value are taken into consideration for the PFD calculation. And actually that leads us into the discussion of the different SIL levels, what actually is a PFD value. So there is a safety integrity level from 1 to 4. So we have a SIL 1 system, SIL 2, 3 and 4 and the rating or the driving characteristic factor behind is a PFD value, probability of failure on demand. And for the SIL 1 system, the values may range between 10 to the power of minus 1 to 2 and so on. So this is the 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3, 3 to 10 to the minus 4. And for a SIL 4 system, the probability of failure on demand is 10 to the minus 4 and that's actually per hour. So you can see the higher the SIL rating, the lower the probability of failure on demand. And this lambda du value is the one driving, well, let me just, let me, driving this PFD value. And when you do the evaluation of your SIS system, it is not sufficient, for example, you require a SIL2 system and when you have a SIL2 requirement that you have to calculate the PFD of the entire chain of command, the entire PF, uh, PFD across the system, so that includes the PFD of the sensor plus the PFD value of the logic solver plus the PFD of the final element and this needs to be below your SIL requirement. So as per the SIL level, I expect, so it's most likely that I find an SIL4 um, system in a, I don't know, a nuclear power station and a SIL1 in a lower critical. Which one you're usually dealing with? Yeah, exactly. It's exactly this way. So the higher the SIL, the higher the criticality, the higher the process risk, if you will, and the higher the consequences of this process getting out of control. And there's actually the IEC 61511 offers a so-called risk graph to calibrate, to assess your process risk and the SIL requirements. And there are actually four different factors taken into consideration. One is the, so the extent of the damage that's called, called with the factor C1 through 4. That is the extent of damage, so it's kind of like a, a decision-making tree. So the a C1 means the extent of damage may, may be a slight injury of a person. C2 speaks for severe injury, a death of a person. C3 is death of one or multiple person. C4 is really drastic, that's more like the nuclear power plant application.
Then a second factor in this is a F like frequency of exposure, frequency one or two, that means how frequent is any person or the operator nearby the machine. So applications we deal with on a daily basis, we have operators, we have personnel walking across the machine, so the exposure is very frequent. And then another factor in this evaluation is the possibility of avoidance. So if you are close to the machine, if you are close to that centrifugal compressor and it explodes, and you stand near, next to it, will, it be, will you be able to avoid being harmed? Likely no. And then there is a probability of this, how often does this process get out of control? And there is a probability of that uh, event happening. And this goes from a very seldom process issue, process critical event, a more or less rare and frequent. Typically, the machines, outfitted with an SIS system do not have frequent issues that are not frequently exploding naturally. And, but as a typical application, we, we may expect severe injury, a death of a person may be something that SIS systems have to avoid. So we would select a C2. Then the exposure of an operator is quite frequent. If you are standing by the machine, you will hardly be able to avoid being harmed. And this instance is v relatively rare. And this logic decision making leads, for example, to a SIL2 no? SIL requirement. So if you in turn have, you may expect on a very rare occasion that you severely injure a person or may risk a death of a person, you require a SIL2 system. So if customers would expect, if you would expect needing a SIL-3, a SIL-4 system, the risks behind in your process have to be really severe. So the risk assessment will be conducted by the operator according to the uh, IEC 61511? Exactly. And, and that is something, glad you mentioned that, the risk assessment and the requirement, the definition of the SIL requirement, definitely something by the operator of the process, exactly. Okay, so there is no way for the operator to make it a little bit more um, uh, less critical because I think uh, with each SIL level you are adding to your system. I expect that there might be some, some money uh, attached to it. So more investment, the higher the SIL level. This in a sense is true, but also there is another aspect to that. Say um, you have a, a solution in mind and you're requirement may be for a SIL2 system. You can do little t uh, tunes and twists to your existing systems so you achieve a higher SIL rating of the system of choice or also improve the PFD, for example, by implementing uh, some redundancy in your systems. So you can, for example, add a two out of three voting system, for example, on the sensor side. So you, instead of having a single, you have triple sensor redundancy what other systems also do when you don't want to go for a additional installation of sensors. Smarter systems also apply a so-called one out of one D, that's a channel diagnostic. So this D, standing for diagnostics, leads to the recognition of faulty instruments, which in turn also leads to a reduced PFD as you increase the number of the dangerous and detected and reduce the dangerous undetected failure modes. Um, another way to reduce the PFD that you have within your system is to increase the number of proof testing intervals. So you increase the frequency of testing your system. In this case, you have to test the entire safety instrumented system and to making sure that it works as intended for this application. So making the proof test for the system means that you test it, for example, once per year, every three years. And if you reduce the testing interval to, say, every half year, every month, that would lead to a linearly reduced PFD value of the components being tested. So frequent testing helps with a lower PFD, but obviously increases the maintenance and the life cycle cost of an instrumented system. I assume that the vast majority of all installations machine installations do not require any SIL level um, associated system. So a 
more basic protection system without any SIL certification might be just enough. Would you recommend to install a SIL system, SIL certified system anyways, so is there added value to it? Yeah, um, if you have the selection, you have systems available that are appropriate for the application, I would go with the higher SIL rating. Why is this relevant? Because if you look, for example, at a, a common standard, a SIL 2 system offers or comes with a risk reduction factor um, between 100 or 1,000, so that really helps with the process risk reduction, even though you may not need it by the standards. And the system itself, the SIS system, comes with a built-in mean time between failure um, that is between 1 and 10 million hours. So you, you will install a very reliable a solution that is very highly available when it needs to act. In turn, I would also say it's even more important, rather than SIL certification, it's more important having a system in place that is appropriate for the application. Imagine you had a large critical centrifugal compressor, a RISIP compressor, and you would equip that with a SIL-3 gas temperature sensor. Um, this would lead to no good because the sensor or the system itself is not appropriate to detect any mechanical issues early enough to prevent the catastrophic damage. You'd rather want to have a system that is fit for purpose. So I would recommend to adhere to the OEM standards and to do what's best for the application to capture these problems reliably on time. Another comment, a, SIL, a highly SIL rated system does not mean that the system effectively captures the problem. It only means that it is likely or very highly available when it needs to be. But as I mentioned in the previous example, a simple temperature sensor, a frame velocity sensor on, on a machine will not catch problems early enough to prevent the catastrophic event. And that was <clears throat> something I just had on my mind because from my understanding the SIL level does not express the powerful the power of uh, the analysis or the um, meaningfulness of the analysis of the protection system itself. It just talks about or expresses the availability when it is demanded. Absolutely, that's exactly correct. And uh, even more so, uh, a high SIL rating means the system will, highly, will be likely available, but it also could lead to the fact that if in doubt, a system that is inappropriate for the application will be highly available when it needs to be, but may also even falsely trip the process, shut down the process, if in any doubt. Because in the sense of these IEC standards guiding this whole subject here, if in any doubt, shut down, no process is the safest way of operation. So a high SIL level does not um, avoid any false, uh, false trips or, uh, or alarms that are, not, um, that are not realistic. So it just says, okay, the system is available and whatever the outcome is, um, it doesn't mean that it is this outcome of quality in terms of it can be a false trip, be it SIL 1 or be it SIL 4. That is correct. So, and, and that's why it, a lot of thought need to be put into the system's design. Recommended, very highly recommended is to put in like channel diagnostics to reduce the number of instruments on the machine, have a system that will recognize faulty instruments, will recognize inherent um, potential problems on the machine and as well as within the instrumentation to avoid false alarms as well as to be fit for purpose and exact right for the application. Okay, thank right. you very much. Thank you. Anything to add from your side? No? You're good. No, I think, okay. thank you very much. Very interesting, also sort of theoretical, but I think it is very useful to know the basics of uh, functional safety. Uh, thanks for viewing this episode of Intelligent Machine Monitoring and um, come back next time.